Hello partners, thanks for joining me here on this video. Yes, this is the story of the little guy named Herb who was in the right place at the right time. Herb grew up in a near poverty state in Collinsville, Pennsylvania, a little town about an hour southeast of Pittsburgh. But when Herb was born in 1905, Connellsville was nearly a lifetime away. Anyone who wanted a job could easily find one. Connellsville was known as the Coke capital of the world. <laughs> now, partners, by Coke, I don't mean Coca-Cola. No, what I'm talking about was another kind of Coke. It was a vital part of steel making. You see, Coke is a type of hotly burning fuel that the blast furnaces needed. A special kind of coal was mined in the hills around Herb's hometown. The coal was then superheated in what are called Coke ovens. What was left was called Coke, C-O-K-E. When Herb was in his teens, he grew tired of Connellsville. He wanted to succeed. And like many young people his age who lived in cities with just one industry, Herb knew he needed to get away somewhere. He had to go someplace larger where he could use his talents. And Herb was a very talented young man. Over the years, he had various jobs, most of them connected with communications. Now, as I like to do, let's fast forward to the mid-1940s. Herb had been assigned by the United States Army Air Force Corps to work with complex electronic equipment. You see, because he had hung around radio stations most of his life and had a background in on-the-air broadcasting, Herb had known a lot of radio engineers along the way. They taught him that there was more to radio than just talking into a microphone. Well, late one night, a military police officer came and told Herb that he was under house arrest. He was what? You heard me. Herb hadn't done anything wrong. No, he was being sent on a special assignment. Now, partners, this is wartime, and secrecy was most important. Herb was taken to a hangar where a brand new super fortress bomber was housed. This super fortress had been built by an aircraft company called Glenn Martin. Later, it became a part of Lockheed. Yes, that's where we called him, Lockheed Martin. Herb knew enough about this plane to realize technically it was a B-29, and he knew that some changes had been made in it that had been extremely modified with special propellers that would practically allow the plane to be thrown into reverse right there on the ground. Yes, it also had some top secret electronics in the cockpit. It was Herb's secret assignment to make sure all of this high-tech equipment was working. Think about this. Herb spent the better part of a week with that plane. He slept in the hangar on a cot. Food was brought to him and the several other technicians that were working with him assigned to the project. Finally, Herb's job was done. One day he watched as this special B-29 got out of the hangar and took off and flew into the sunset. He was not told anything more about the plane. His superior officer only told Herb that he was to say nothing about the equipment he installed and to tell his comrades that he was out on special assignment. Nothing more. Herb, you're just on a special assignment. That's all you tell your people, anyone you know. Well, three months later, Herb learned why he had been called upon to do all this special work on that B-29 bomber. One afternoon in August of 1945, Herb's commanding officer called him into his office. 
Herb, I guess you heard the news, his commanding officer asked. Herb answered, yes. The Army Air Force has dropped an atomic bomb onto a city in Japan. His commander then said, that's right, Herb. This might just bring an end to the war. Everything went smoothly, especially because of the special guidance equipment that had been installed in that plane by you, Herb. It's you who may have helped to shorten World War II. The commander thanked Herb and told him he'd be in line for a promotion. Well, Herb was excited nicely, grateful. He never did get that promotion. But the war did end, and it ended quickly. Herb moved back to Chicago, where his wife had been waiting for him during the long months he had been away. Herb had a great career on the air and radio and had wonderful memories of that week in 1945 where he installed the equipment in that plane, the Enola Gay, E-N-O-L-A-G-A-Y, the Enola Gay B-29 bomber that helped in the war. Well, in his later years, Herb moved to a tiny house on a lovely lake just outside of Morgantown, West Virginia. He became the public relations director of the University of West Virginia. You call this report the man who was there when it happened. Jimmy, where is all this going? Well, Herb may have installed all that equipment in the Enola Gay, but he wasn't there when the bomb was dropped. <laughs> no, no, you're right. I'm glad you asked. It shows you are paying attention. This is like opening a script of a real mystery. You see, his association with the atomic bomb wasn't the first time Herb was associated with one of the biggest bangs of all time. And this part of the story did put Herb in the right place at the right time. Will you tell us? Yeah, yeah. You see, back in 1937, Herb was working for Chicago radio station WLS. He was sent by his boss with an engineer and a bulky machine that actually made recordings on disc to get some interviews with people from Chicago who would be arriving from Europe. Yes, partners, it was Herb, Herb Morrison, who was recording a description of the Hindenburg landing when it burst into flames. Herb's recording has been played millions of times. If anyone does remember Herb Morrison, it was for his incredible description of the crash of the Hindenburg. Dear partners, I'm sitting here shaking. I want to cry because I saw Herb Morrison at the Pacific Pioneer Broadcasters meeting at the Sportsman's Lodge. And we all gave him a standing ovation when the movie of the Hindenburg's burning as it fell to the ground was shown. But, as you know, that was only the first big bang in which he had had a hand. Herb Morrison was a kind and gentle man who was one of the radio's best remembered on-the-spot announcers. But also as one of the most important behind-the-scenes people during the closing days of the Second World War. To think I was alive and saw that man. So as Paul Harvey used to say, the next time someone talks about the Hindenburg disaster and says something about that radio guy who recorded the coverage, you should tell them the rest of the story about Herb Morrison the man who helped end World War II. Okay, partners, you know the drill. Look up there. Click that box with the red X and go immediately back to the page for the rest of this week's report. Oh, golly, this means so much being able to say this to you. Report something that Dennis writes for us. I love you. Go get them, tigers. <laughs>